we at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell just approved the biggest interest rate increase since 1994 right as we're entering an official bear market. He knows that we're caught between record high inflation and the risk of a real recession. And this time, the money printer is going in the wrong direction. We could also see more big rate hikes in the future, which has a significant effect on everything from consumer loans and credit cards, all the way to the stock market and even crypto. Want to know what to expect over the next few months and the best way to invest? My name is Alex and I'll show you what I'm doing step by step. Let's start with the Federal Reserve and interest rates, and then connect that to what's happening with stocks today. A lot of people think that Jerome Powell's job is to keep the stock market going up. After all, why else print trillions of dollars as soon as the stock market started to crash? In reality, the Fed has two main goals, keep prices stable and keep unemployment relatively low. That means fighting inflation, but not fighting it so hard that money stops moving altogether. Here's how that works. When unemployment is low and nearly everyone has a job, they have the money to buy goods and services. That means demand goes up while supply stays the same. For example, a restaurant or a movie theater can only hold so many people and stores only have so much inventory. So what do these businesses do? They raise their prices. On the other hand, if unemployment gets too high, there's way more supply than demand since people can no longer afford to buy those same goods and services. So prices go down, which encourages more people to spend. There's a sweet spot that the Fed is aiming for between keeping unemployment low enough and keeping prices stable enough. Prices being stable enough usually means a real interest rate of around 2%. What is a real interest rate? Well, let's say that interest rates are at 1%, but inflation is at 2%. What that actually means is that while the nominal interest rate is 1%, the real interest rate on borrowing money is negative 1%. That means lenders actually lose money on low interest loans after accounting for higher inflation. The borrower is actually up by that same amount of money. Well, it turns out that because of high inflation and currently low interest rates, the real one month interest rate today is at negative 7% and the real one year interest rate is at around negative 4%. This is why borrowing money felt so cheap and easy over the last couple of years. And since inflation in the US is actually sitting at around 8%, a real interest rate of around 2% would mean that the Federal Reserve would have to raise interest rates to a whopping 10%. Don't worry, I'm not saying that's actually what's going to happen. In fact, during this last FOMC meeting, they said that they think inflation has started to peak and should return to much lower numbers over the next couple of years. Then again, they also said inflation was transitory, so maybe take that with a grain of salt. Anyway, that's the connection between unemployment, interest rates, and inflation. Before we can understand how this connects back to the stock market, we have to understand what the Fed's interest rate actually does. The Federal Reserve just raised something called the Federal Funds Rate, which is also called the Overnight Lending Rate. The Overnight Lending Rate is the interest rate that banks charge each other when they borrow money from each other in the overnight market. Banks borrow money from each other in the first place because they're required to have a certain amount of cash on hand based on the amount of loans they have on their books. If they have less than they need at the end of the day, they borrow the extra money from other banks with interest. That interest rate is this overnight lending rate. When the Federal Reserve raises the overnight lending rate, that extra borrowing cost gets passed along from the banks to you and me in the form of mortgage rates and credit card interest rates and so on. Higher interest rates make it harder for companies to borrow money as well, which means it's harder to invest in new assets, build new teams, or fund new projects. This is a real double whammy for publicly traded companies because rising interest rates also make bond yields rise. Bonds are safe investments, so when their yields rise, stocks need to perform even better to justify buying them over these safe, better performing bonds. That risk is one reason that stocks and cryptocurrencies are both falling and why they've become so tightly correlated over the past few months. That's why it's so important to diversify at least a little bit into assets that can generate solid returns but don't correlate with stocks or cryptocurrencies. For example, around 40% of my assets are actually in real estate. But real estate prices have already gone up like crazy and a massive purchase like a home isn't right for every budget. That's why I partnered with Masterworks.io, the only platform that lets you invest in physical, multi-million dollar paintings without breaking the bank. According to reports by Citibank, Contemporary are almost tripled the S&P 500's returns from 1995 to 2020, and Fine Art has the lowest correlation of stocks out of any major asset class. Recently, Masterworks sold a painting by Albert Olin, returning almost 34% to investors after fees. 
investing with them is a breeze. You just go to masterworks.io, select the number of shares of the painting you want, and then buy them the same way you already buy stocks. Then you either wait for the painting to be sold or you can sell your shares on their secondary market. It's that easy. Right now, they're giving my audience VIP access, which lets you skip their waitlist entirely. I'll leave a link to that exclusive offer for you in the description below. All right, let's get into the numbers. Here's a chart from the New York Times that shows you what the overnight lending rate has been going back to 1998. The Federal Reserve just raised the overnight lending rate by 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent. That's the biggest interest rate increase since 1994. The gray regions on this plot are the recessions, like the dot-com crash in early 2000, or the great financial crisis in 2008, and the pandemic in early 2020. The federal funds rate has been close to zero for most of the time since 2008, and the Federal Reserve brought it back to zero right as the pandemic began. Another thing is that the federal funds rate can't go below zero. I know that sounds obvious, but my point is that if we do enter another recession, the federal funds rate needs to be in a position where the Fed can actually lower it. That's one of their big challenges right now. If we enter a recession and the rate is already near zero, there's no wiggle room for the Fed to lower rates and help the economy. So one reason that they're raising rates so fast is to have some flexibility if and when we do enter into a recession, which is a serious possibility right now. After this most recent FOMC meeting, the federal funds rate is sitting at 1.75%. Some estimates now have the federal funds rate at around 3.8% by the end of next year, and then falling to around 3.4% sometime in 2024. The important thing to understand here is that the federal funds rate is not the same thing as the rate for your loans or business loans. When the Fed raises interest rates by half a percent, other kinds of loans and credit rates can go up by a few percent at a time. For example, since the Federal Reserve announced their plans to increase interest rates last fall, the 30-year mortgage rate has spiked by almost 3% from 3% all the way up to almost 6% today. So that's a doubling in mortgage rates from just six months ago. Just to put that into perspective, a $1 million 30-year fixed rate mortgage at 3% interest is $4,200 a month. At 6% interest, it's $6,000 a month instead, which is a 43% bigger payment each month. Businesses get loans and lines of credit for much more than a million dollars, and all those loans just became way more expensive. Remember when I said that the Fed had two jobs, keeping prices stable and keeping unemployment low? Well, Tesla is laying off around 10% of its salaried workforce, according to an email from Elon Musk earlier this month. And earlier this week, Coinbase said that it was letting go around 1,100 people, or 18% of their total workforce. And last quarter, Peloton's CEO stepped down as they began to cut 2,800 jobs across every level of their organization. That's around 20% of their workforce. The list of tech companies cutting staff is pretty massive. My point is to highlight the real effects that rising interest rates and a looming recession have on these publicly traded companies, which obviously affects their stocks. Speaking of which, the S&P 500 officially entered a bear market, which is defined as a 20% drawdown from recent highs. So one thing we can do is put everything together by looking at data from previous bear markets and recessions to help manage our expectations for this one. According to data from LPL Research, the S&P 500 saw 17 bear markets or near bear markets since World War II. Here they are ordered by date. The biggest drawdown was in the Great Financial Crisis of 2008, where the S&P 500 dropped by almost 57%. The shortest drawdown was the most recent one, where the pandemic caused a 34% crash in just over four weeks. Overall, the average drawdown during a bear market is over 29% and the average duration is a little under a year. But the numbers change if we look at bear markets that were also accompanied by a recession versus those that weren't. Eight of the past 17 bear markets weren't during a recession. These bear markets only drew down by around 24% on average and lasted about seven months. So if we don't enter a recession in the next couple weeks, the S&P 500 has about another 3% to fall from their peak to get to the average and roughly six more weeks to do it. The other nine bear markets did occur during a recession. Their average drawdown was almost 35%, and they lasted for just over 15 months. So bear markets in recessions go about 11% lower than those that don't, and take twice as long. Yikes. So if we do enter a recession, the S&P 500 has another 14% to fall from its peak, and another 7 months or so to do it. The important note here is that this isn't an either-or scenario, and what actually happens really will depend on how persistent inflation will be. 
Remember, the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, looks at the average change of prices over time. These are changes that have already happened. That means inflation is something that we measure in the rearview mirror. It doesn't take into account current supply chain disruptions or challenges. The war between Russia and Ukraine is continuing to spike the prices of commodities like wheat and oil. Wheat prices are still near 40-year record highs. The war is also causing a worldwide fertilizer shortage right now, which is going to cause a food shortage later in the year due to all the crops that didn't get planted. Separately from that, several big cities in China are still grappling with pandemic-related lockdowns. So food, energy, and imported goods are all going to keep going up in price, inflating future CPI numbers, or at the very least, making inflation go down much slower than it usually would which is the exact thing that the Fed is fighting by raising this overnight lending rate. All right, we've covered a lot of ground. I've talked about the relationship between the overnight lending rate, inflation, unemployment, recessions, and the stock market, and what we can expect based on previous bear market data. Now that we've come full circle, here are five things that I've been doing that you can do as well. Like we saw with the data, we're not really out of the woods yet. Even if we don't enter a recession, the average bear market is a little deeper and a little longer than the one we've been in so far. But according to that same data, 18 out of 19 of those bear markets were way less than two years long and were already six months in. So the first thing you should do is not get discouraged. Don't panic sell at a loss just to reinvest that money in a couple of months. Second, take this time to build cash. You should always keep six months of your real expenses as cash in the bank, just in case of an emergency. Like I showed you earlier, even Tesla is laying off 10% of their workforce. Make sure that you're in a position to weather a storm if something bad happens to you or a loved one like losing a job or having a medical emergency. Third, make sure you're paying down your high interest debts like credit cards or your variable interest debts as interest rates continue to rise. Make sure you're working those monthly payments into your six-month emergency fund as well. The fourth thing you should do is really build out your watch list. Money gets made by buying low, not just selling high. So take these next few weeks and really research your favorite investments and narrow down your list to just the handful of assets and businesses that you'd be happy to own over the next five to 10 years. Make sure your list is diversified and not just assets that all move together. By the way, I don't make any money when you sign up for masterworks.io. I just think they have a great service at a really important time in the market. And finally, once you have that six-month emergency fund, you have your high-interest debts taken care of, and you figured out what assets you want to hold and why, then I would start slowly dollar-cost averaging into them. That's how you put yourself in a position to be greedy when others are being fearful. Want to know which stocks I'm being greedy on right now? Check out this episode next. And if you feel I've earned it, hit those like and subscribe buttons to let me know that you enjoy this kind of content. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.